All right. You'll need it. What if you get attacked by false doctrine today on your way out or in church? You use the Bible. You use your weapon against it. Um, 2 Corinthians 10. And um, I was thinking about it, praying about it this morning and Seemed like God would have me go just a little bit different direction this morning, so that's what I'm going to do. This will be in preparation for 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul talks about another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. Talks about Satan being transformed into an angel of light. All of these are very, very relevant um, issues. Very relevant issues. Uh, teachings for people um, and let me just say this there's there's some people who um, as they sit through various lessons um, they may seem um, elementary they may seem like uh, these are foundational teachings and you already know them and so on and I understand that but there are so many others that um, that we are reaching that are that are new, and they're learning some of these things that you've known all of your life. They're learning them for the very first time. So it's always good to go back and and look at look at things, look at doctrines, look at teachings, look at understandings that we have, things that we've known for years that others may not know. And uh, because of the nature of uh, the ministry that God's given us, uh, we, don't, we don't always know who's watching and, and who's joining with us online. But I do know that there are some out there that they have been blown about by all kinds of false doctrine. And God has brought them here to be settled and, and to be taught. And there are some, and some, there are some things that you have to teach out of people by using the Word of God so that God could bring in what's right into their life. Does that make sense to everybody? And uh, so that's uh, sometimes that's what I'm doing. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, uh, he said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And we've been sort of talking about uh, spiritual strongholds, nests, and areas where the devil will build in our lives as a position of warfare against us. Uh, these devils, that we, that's what we're wrestling against. Any issue that you're going through, at its core, is a spiritual issue. All right, and if you will deal with it on a spiritual, in a spiritual manner, on a spiritual level, if you'll deal with it that way, um, the warfare will be more successful than if you were to just try to do it in the flesh. And so, anyway, but they are uh, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse five, casting down imagination. And um, this morning, I want you to think of things that have been cast down in the Bible, things that have been thrown down, things that have been destroyed. Um, think of, I'll just throw this in because we're going to go there in a little bit, the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was man trying to build himself up. And we're going to see how he was doing that. God saw it and he cast man back down from that lofty position. All right? And if, and if you just stop and think about it, man has something in him that desires to go upward. All of our cities, every city in the world has buildings that, especially in the richest cities, powerful cities in the world, they're trying to build the highest, tallest, biggest building that can be built. All right? There's something in man that wants to attain 
to greater height. We're, we're wanting to put people on Mars and there are people who are volunteering to go to Mars and not come back. They're not going for a temporary assignment to be brought back to tell the world how it was. They're going there to die because we have the technology, they think, to get them there. We don't have the technology to get them back home. And all of these people are signing up saying, this is the opportunity of your lifetime. This is man's greatest achievement. We want to be part of it, even though we know that probably we won't be there for years and years and years and years. It's just not possible. But we want our name to go down in history as the people who climb the highest that man can climb. And Mars would be the highest so far that man's been. Um, that is if you don't believe everything you hear on the internet. Okay? Because some people think that we never got above climbing a tree or something like that. All right? Anyway, um, uh, I won't get into all that. But anyway, casting down imaginations. I'll explain that in a little bit. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God... And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience was filled. Do you look on the things after the outward appearance? If any man trust himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. Now I want you to go back to uh, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Um, I want you to take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And while you're turning there, let me explain a little bit about how God designed us. Um, I have a fascination with, uh, I want to learn this Bible. I want to know what it says, and I also, I have a, I just have a curious mind when it comes to wanting to understand things. I see that uh, a lot in Caleb. Caleb, uh, he's, he's, he's aggravating his mother to death because he's in the stage right now where he's very inquisitive and he's, he's taken some of his toys and He'll come in and get some of my tools, and he'll run back in his bedroom. Caleb, what are you doing? And I'll go in there, and I'll look, and I'll see him tearing apart his electronic toys, taking them apart. Why is he doing that? He wants to see how it works. To see how it works. I used to do that. Dad used to buy me tape recorders and radios, and I'd take them apart. I want to see how they work. Okay? And I... Just do all kinds of cool things with them. I'd never get them back together right half the time, but I, I just wanted to. He, and he's at that age; he's wanting to understand things. And so I'm still at that age. I want to understand how God made us. And I started studying the human mind, the human brain, uh, here a while back. And it's actually there's a complexity to it, but there's also a simplicity to it. And let me just explain this part. God gave you two, they're called hemispheres, two sides to your brain. There is a connection between them, but each half of your brain operates in a unique and a specific way. And let me explain that. The left side of your brain is actually the strong side. And I'm not sure why God did it this way, but the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. Okay, I don't know if you know that. Anybody that's had a, if they have a stroke over here, it affects them here. All right? The instructions that your brain sends to the right side of your body come from the left side of your brain. For those of you that are right-handed, the right hand is your area of strength. All right. In the Bible, the right hand is the area of strength in the scriptures. Uh, Jesus is sitting at God's right hand. The book is at God's right hand and so on. So the right hand represent, in the Bible represents the area of strength. The left side of your brain, when it comes to how we think, 
The left side of your brain uh, deals with logic, absolutes, things on the left side of your brain, things are either true or false. Numbers. Um, as you're reading the Bible, it's the left side of your brain that's decoding the symbols that are on the page and decoding them in and putting them together into letters and how they sound, words, how they sound, and when we read a complete sentence, the left side of our brain is what tells us the grammar of that sentence and puts it together in a way that we can understand it. So that's the left side of your brain. If you were to draw a picture of, and I, was, I, had, I have one in my stock somewhere, and I didn't have, uh, when I decided to go this direction this morning, I didn't have time to go look for it. But I, I found this picture on the internet, and it's neat. Because it draws out what each side of your brain is responsible for. If you were to picture this side of your brain, the left side of your brain, it would be like guys sitting at computer stations typing out computer programs to make the computer work. All right? It, it deals with logic. It deals with absolutes. It deals with making decisions that are right or wrong or whatever, all right? Black and white. There is no gray on this side of the brain. Everything is either right or wrong, yes or no, on or off, things like that. That's how this side of the brain works. It's the logic part of the brain. The right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. If you're right-handed, the right side of the brain controls the weaker side of your body. The right side of your brain is actually the weaker part of your brain, all right? When you make a decision, you make a decision based upon the collection of your thoughts. The left side of your brain is going to make a decision of whether or not something is right or wrong, something is good or bad. Uh, something is going to turn, if we do something, it's going to turn out positive or negative for us. That's the left side of the brain. The right side of the brain has to do with creativity. Poetry comes from and is best understood from the right side of the brain. Lyrics in songs, the songs themselves, the notes, um, Drawings and paintings that a person does is seen in the right side of the brain. If I were to say to you, picture an elephant, what did you just do? Pictured an elephant. That came from the right side of your brain. The right side of your brain has this amazing ability to draw pictures, make movies. Okay? The right side of your brain can make a movie. All right? So I want everybody to think of you sitting in your car, going down Interstate 55, and you're going to get off the highway and make a right. D just did it. I saw her close her eyes. Okay? That was the, that was the right side of your brain that did that. Okay? Now, the, the left side of your brain took the instructions that I gave you. They were very concrete instructions. But the right side of your brain drew the picture. It added the color. It added the texture of the car, the car seat, what, what weather was going on outside. Believe it or not, my mind could only draw a gray, and that probably has to do with that's how the weather is out there. Okay? But anyway, that's how it works. Let me, let me apply it like this. When you're reading your Bible, the left side of your brain is taking in the words on the page and, give it, and understanding them for exactly what they say. But the right side of your brain is helping you see what's in your Bible by drawing a picture for you so that you can understand it better. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? As I'm... If I, were, if I were telling you some story about deer season or if I was fishing 
or I went on a trip or some. If I'm telling you this story, the, the left side of your brain is understanding what I'm telling you, but the right side of your brain is drawing for your mind a picture, your own picture of what I'm describing. And your own picture probably would not match what I saw and experienced, but it's trying to see it as I'm relaying it to you, okay? You need both sides of your brain to think. When you're trying to make a decision, the left side of your brain is determining whether something's right or wrong, but the right side of your brain is drawing out scenarios of how things could turn out based upon this decision. It's actually making movies and YouTube videos, short sequences of how things could go once a certain decision is made. Both of those parts of your brain are necessary, but the left side of your brain, the logic part that makes the yes and no decisions should be the one that's always in charge and superior to the creativity side. Let me give you an example. Okay? If you remember, some of you that are older, you remember the days back when hippies first started experimenting with things like LSD. And LSD does, does one thing very well. It shuts down the logic side of the brain, turns the computers off, and it enhances the right side of the brain. And these people will have what they call it trips, trips on LSD. And it enhances the right side. And back there was there was times when these guys were overdosing on LSD. They would be the ones standing on top of 30-story buildings and jumping off of them because they imagine that they could fly. Now, if you're not on LSD, you're standing at the edge of a 30-story building. Your, the left side of your brain is telling you, if you take one more step, you're dead. The left side of your brain says, there's gravity here. You, do, you cannot violate the laws of gravity. You're going to splat, and it's going to be over for you. When they were taking some of these drugs, the right side of the brain was creating for them a scenario and they actually believed that they could overcome the laws of gravity and stepping off a 30-story building, they would just be flying through the air and land with little butterfly wings gracefully out into a field of daisies or something like that. And they ended up dead, okay? Now, here's what I want you to do, and I don't want you to be offended at this. Okay? But this is how God designed things. Uh, and I've used this illustration before. When it comes to Lisa and I, you know, we've got things worked out is where I, I will paint the bathroom, but she'll give me the colors. Okay? I just painted the house, inside of the house, and for the first time in 30 years, she went with a different color than white. Because when I paint, I paint white. White is absolute. Okay? And don't ask me to be creative. What, what Lisa all the time says, do you like this? There's no way in the world I'm going to say, I hate that. That's awful. I would never pick that. I'm not going to do that. Okay? She's picking out colors now for our bedroom. She's not asking me to pick out colors for our bedroom. She's picking out color. Okay? She's the creative one. I'm not. Okay? That's how it works. When God looked at Adam, he said it is not good that the man should be alone. Now think of the two sides of your brain. The left hemisphere, the logic part, would be the man. The right hemisphere, the creative part, would be the woman. The man needs the woman to help him think. My wife does not see the world the way I do. God did not design her to see the world the way I see it. 
There's been times when my wife has told me, be careful of such and such. Be careful of a certain person. And I'd say, why? I don't know. I just don't, I don't like them. Or I don't like this situation. She was basing that decision on her feelings, on her intuition. Okay? On the, the fact that she thinks outside of what she sees. And over the years, I've learned to listen to her, but not let that her decision control what I do. But I take her decision or the way she feels about things into consideration because God has shown me that she's here in my life to help me see things that, that I don't see. Does that make sense? You're, I mean, you're, you and your wife, same way. You and Gloria, I know you two. It's the same thing, okay? And so when God said to the man, it's not good that he should be alone, I'm, look at your brain. You're, you cannot make all logical decisions. Some of your decisions are based upon love, not logic. Why did you marry Diane? Was it the logical thing to do? He loved her. Okay? She was nice looking to you. Okay? And so this is why we do what we do. This is how our brain works. Now, I said all that to say this. God said to cast down imaginations. Cast down imagination. When imaginations, when this side of your brain is running the show and, and in charge over how you make decisions, that's not right and it won't work. Okay? It's like I said, you can read the Bible, and the Bible says what it says, and your mind is helping you see stories like David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den and all these things. They're there to help us with an understanding of what this Bible is, but we don't just imagine God in our mind and in our heart. Because anybody who just imagines God will create a God in their mind and in their heart that does not match what the Bible says about God and who God is. Man left to only his imaginations will always imagine and dream and create and carve out a God that does not match the God that is written in this book. There has to be a static, unmovable, unchangeable image of who God is and is contained in our Bibles. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? Huh? When we imagine a different God, it's always going to appear differently than what's in the Bible. We're going to add things to God that are not God. We're going to add, and this is what we do with the Bible. And what's, what I see going on in churches right now is that imaginations are overriding the Word of God. Anytime someone says, well, I don't feel God would do this to somebody. I don't feel like God would throw people in hell. That's an imagination that is usurping the authority of the written Word of God. God says that all the nations shall be cast into hell that forget God. I just butchered that verse, but you get the idea. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all them that forget... I still didn't quote it right, but anyway. The Bible says what it says. We don't let our imaginations override that. Amen? Okay? Think of who the devil went to in the Garden of Eden. Did he go to Adam, the logic, or did he go to Eve, the imagination, the... the, the the feelings, the emotions. If a man commits adultery, does he do it based upon what's right and wrong? Or does he do it based upon his imaginations and his feelings? Am I right? Okay. We don't, we don't do that stuff based upon what's right. If we did what was right, we, would, we wouldn't do that. That was the case where our imaginations overrode our logic. She 
took us for a ride. She is always Mystery Babylon, the Great, the Mother of Harlots. She always is responsible for the area of imaginations. Let's look in Genesis chapter 6. I've said I've been talking all this long without reading scripture. That always makes me nervous. Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, look at how, look at how the Bible puts it, the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man reverted to his imaginations. He let his imaginations govern his conduct. Whatever man imagined to do, that's what he did. A man or a woman that commits adultery, first, before they do it, they almost always imagine a scenario of committing adultery with somebody. And that always turns out great. It always turns out wonderful. It always, the imagination always says, man, this is going to be awesome. Right? It's what imaginations do. This is why the devil went to the weaker vessel. Went to the, the woman, the female. The imagination. The feelings. Okay? So verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. There's four things here. For it repenteth me that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was one person who did not let his imaginations govern his conduct nor his actions. He realized that he needed grace, he went looking for grace, and he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah, Noah was using the right, the right part of his heart. Turn to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Where do big buildings come from? Big buildings come from the imagination of someone who imagines the building first, draws it out on paper, then wins the contest. Uh, the St. Louis Arch is the product of, I'll get his name right, Aero Serenin. That, uh, that was the architect's name who designed the St. Louis Arch. And that arch, that building, and it's magnificent. Anybody that comes here to visit, I encourage you to go to the arch. Go see it, go touch it, go get on top of it. That used to scare me when I was a little child. We're going to go on top of the arch. And I pictured us literally on top of the arch. And I'm going, I'll fall off. Okay? I didn't know that you were inside of the thing. Okay? Anyway. Uh, but it, the arch started out as someone's imagination. It was not reality. It started out as an image or a thought in someone's mind. They were creating... What, what, what they thought would look good in downtown St. Louis, all right? Every tall building, every statue, uh, every room in the world, everything always started out in someone's mind as part of their imagination. That, again, is not necessarily bad because God gave that to us. But imaginations must always Remain in their place. Never the ones who are making the decisions. So anyway, Genesis 11 verse 1. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar. They now refer to that as Sumeria. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. They imagined it first. It started out in their imagination. All right. Um, <clears throat> Sterling and I used to talk all the time about science fiction. Okay, He would read these little dime store novels. 
graphic, they call them graphic novels, not comic books back then. I used to read the same kind of stuff, science fiction. Okay? And his daddy would tell him, what do you read that stuff for? That'll never happen. Okay? Oh, yeah. The science fiction of yesterday is happening today. Ray Bradbury, in, when he wrote Fahrenheit 451, he imagined a, a world that, that banned books. And, that, and they burned books. And anybody that had books was in trouble. But one of the things that Ray Bradbury imagined was is that people in their entertainment cravings would have an entire wall in their living room that was a TV set. And the goal was to have your whole living room, all four walls, turned into a giant TV set so that you basically would be immersed in the TV show that, that used all four views in your living room. Well, we pert near have TV sets that take up entire walls of our living rooms, but we're also entering into the age of virtual reality. What was you telling me, Ryan, about the new phone that you said was coming out? Was that you? The camera on the phone takes 360 degree pictures. What that's for is the virtual reality sets that are coming out now that are people are, are getting used to where, and I saw one of these for the first time the other day, a video where as the video played, I had the ability to look around me, look up, down, and all around as the scene was playing out, I was able to look everywhere in that scene, not just what one fixed camera was showing me. Ray Bradbury dreamed that up 50 years ago. And now it's a little bit different than what he saw, but it's totally immersive. The dreamers dream it up. The scientists say, they don't say, can we do that? They say, how can we do that? And they set about to go do it. But it takes the dreamers first. So the dreamers dreamed up a scenario by which man could reach the heavens. Think about it. We have a space station orbiting planet Earth that has a constant supply of human beings on it. Man has reached that height. Now they're talking about a permanent moon base. That was dreamed up years ago. There was a TV show called Space 1999. Okay? Where we had a permanent moon base. Now we're talking about a permanent place on Mars. And we're dreaming beyond that. We're dreaming about go going out and being Star Trek and going to other parts of the galaxy through wormholes and things like that. We're dreaming this up and man is going to figure out how to do it. Now watch this. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. In verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Look at here. God is pinpointing the imagination as the source of the problem. Because, and I mentioned this before. No one just commits adultery. Adultery starts out in the imagination. Starts out on the right side of the brain with you drawing a picture in your mind of what it would be like to be with a certain woman or a certain man. We draw that picture out we act it out in our mind. We think of how wonderful it would be. And if we're not careful, the imaginations of our mind become the reality of our lives. Are you listening to me? Every sin begins with an imagination of committing that sin. Starts out where the devil, listen, 
The devil goes to the imagination of man, not his logic. The devil never says, it is wrong to commit adultery. Would you like to try it? He never does that. He goes to the woman. He goes to the weaker vessel. He goes to the imagination through the eyes, through the ears, through any of the senses. And he goes to the imagination of your brain, of your mind. And he gets you to draw out a really, really nice picture of what sin you're going to commit. And if you're not careful, the more you put the imaginations in there, the more likely it's going to be that you're going to act on those imaginations. This is precisely why the Apostle Paul is telling us Cast, I don't have the verse here, but cast those down. Cast those imaginations down. Because if you don't, that Tower of Babel that you're building in your mind is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And before long, you will, not be, you will have no control over your impulses. You'll just act upon your evil desires. The heart of man, the Bible says, is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Who can keep up with how wicked man's devices get to be? Cast those things down, people. Okay, we're running out of time. And uh, I'm going to show you how to do that. But let me, let me give you this, okay? God told in the law, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven, what? What was the word in the King James? Image. Where does an image of a false god start out? The imagination. It starts out with man imagining God. And whenever man imagines God and does not let the Bible dictate to him who God is, man will always imagine a God that is false and fake and not the real God. Amen? You, you, if you want to study something, study images, imaginations in the Bible. Man's imagination is what always gets him in trouble. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word.